Hello everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. We're back with another Frequently Asked Questions Friday. So as ever, we have a whole bunch of incredibly good questions in Frequently Asked Questions, Fact Friday. Please hit that notifications bell once you have subscribed, if you haven't already. Go to producelikeapro.com, you can sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. You can also, of course, try out the 14-day free trial of the Academy. Without much further ado, let us get stuck into the questions. Does it make sense to use a de-esser to control tracks that lead to conflicts in the mix? I mean, instead of EQ. Absolutely. If you have watched any of my vocal mixing videos, for instance, um, I have a, quite a successful one. I'm sure there is a link flying around here. You'll notice that I will DS at the beginning of a track just to control any obvious S's or T's that get carried away. But then after I've boosted some high-end EQ to make the whole track fill area, I will use a de-esser again because I want it to feel area, but I don't want to exaggerate the really aggressive S's and T's. Then, believe it or not, if I compress an EQ again, I might use, yeah, you guessed it, possibly a third de-esser. It's an amazing way of controlling vocals once you've boosted the high end, but also, and this is a big favorite of mine, controlling very, very aggressive and harsh sounding electric guitars. A lot of albums I mix have a combination of incredibly brightly recorded electric guitars, and then often, this is a problem you probably face as well, is guys and girls using amp emulations that are incredibly digital. And they may not have an IR, may not have an impulse response on it, which adds more of a speaker sound. Maybe the emulation they use is really, really brash. And in that instance, a de can be wonderful. You can also load an IR on it as well. There'll be a link around here where you can load, download some IRs. But the reality is, is that's where de are really worth their weight in gold for controlling any kind of high-end harshness. I really, really, really recommend you try them. There's been tons of videos and my video breakdowns where you see me using de specifically to control harsh, high-end in any instrument. But particularly, guitars, are, it's, great, it's a great tool. Acoustic guitars, where you get that kind of kind of like string, kind of high-end. It's fantastic when a guy or a girl is slapping on the guitar and those clicks are so bright and taking your head off. Put a DS on it, on acoustic. They're a really wonderful tool that could be used in so many different instances. So I highly recommend using a DSer for many things outside of just de -essing. Is it better for mixing to convert the MIDI clips to audio clips? That's a marvelous question. I mean, yes and no. If it's um, your session and you have committed to the piano sound, for instance, or the drum sounds, for instance, and you're using MIDI, of course, if you're producing around it and you're gonna mix it, yeah, commit it to audio, it's there forever. When I'm giving stuff to external mixers, I might do both. I might keep the MIDI, even with the plug-in on it, but I'll also print it the way I like to hear it. And invariably, they'll use the piano or the drum track or the synth track, whatever it is, that I printed because that was part of the production. But I just leave it in there just in case. They give me a call and say, you know what, Warren, I didn't really dig your piano sound, and then I have to upload the MIDI. I just give them the MIDI anyway. Um, the only thing I will say is the main reason to print your audio in any situation, whether it be a MIDI track, whether it be multiple delays and EQs and reverbs and flanges and whatever, is for CPU. So always take that into account. You're going to want to print stuff that is incredibly exhausting on your computer. If your computer is like stumbling through and crashing every minute and a half because of the weight of these hundreds of plugins, that's the time that you start printing your audio. Regardless of MIDI, just any audio tracks, you might start 
committing then so you can free up the power of your CPU to at least get through the song so you can mix it. How do you mix the C12A in your piano track? Dead center with the two U47s, L and R, left and right? Yep, that's exactly how I do it. I use it purely as a mono mic. Sometimes it will be the only mic. The trick came from when I was with Dave Sardi at Sunset Sound Studio 2. Working with the Thrills, they had put a C12A up as a mono only mic on the piano and then baffled all over the top. Every day we were coming back in convinced that the piano was sounding better. Like, how could that be? It's all baffled off. Every day I was like, ah, oh, it sounds better. This C12A was sitting like this on the piano. And what had been happening, unbeknownst to us, was the mic had been slowly falling down. And eventually, when we pulled off the packing blankets, it was sitting there almost exactly in a hole in the frame of the piano, just like this. This front part of the capsule pointing down like this, not touching the frame, miraculously not touching the frame. And it sounded phenomenal. So, ever since then, whenever I mic up a piano with a mono mic, if I have a C12A, I use it. If I don't have one, I use a 414. If I don't have a 414, I'll stick any kind of large diaphragm mic available and put it in a sound hole in the frame of the piano. And it gives you, you know, as you'd imagine, a little bit of a metallic sound, but what it does give you is a really good, balanced mono sound of the piano. So I highly recommend it. Are you mixing on your headphones through the computer's headphone jack or through the interface? When you see me mixing in the box on our live stream, I'm using either an ID4 or an ID14. Those are audience interfaces. However, when I'm mixing on a laptop, I invariably just plug in and start doing it. it there's not always a one size fits all. It really depends on the circumstance, whether I'm traveling, what I have available. Either way, I don't want to stop myself from being able to work. Ideally, I like the sound of the Audion ID4 or the ID14, and I'm used to them, used to how they sound. I take my blue Lolas and I plug them in there and they sound great and I'm used to it. And of course, I use the Sonar Works, which I highly recommend. And if you're an Academy member, remember you can get a huge discount on that. The point you made about using the Pro Junior was interesting. With this in mind, could you record a DI and blend a 112 impulse response with a 412 impulse response to get the best of both? I don't remember specifically which one you're talking about with the Pro Junior, um, but yes, that's the thing about using the impulse responses. Um, we've touched on it a couple of times. Now, there's gonna be a link down here where you can download the free Lancaster Audio Impulse Response Loader. It's totally free, the loader. And then you can put your impulses in there. So check out that link. I'll put it in the email as well, and it will be on the blog page. So please feel free to download that. Yes, you can. You could Honestly, you could put it on an amp, an already recorded amp. You could put it on a DI using an emulation of any amp that you like. I've done it with Sans amps. You can open up a Sans amp, something really super digital, and then stick an IR afterwards, an impulse response afterwards. There are many. The ones that I've been involved with at Lancaster Audio have Bob Marlette's ones, Cameron Webb's ones, um, Auric Wilds, mine, Sahaj's, Trey Xavier from Gear Gods, um, Glenn Frickers, there's tons, plus, Loads of other ones that they, that Lancaster have gone out and sampled from all over the place. All these different classic cabs. So it's a really good idea to just try it on pretty much everything. Because what you're essentially doing is taking a signal source and then applying it across anything. You're putting a cab emulation on something. It's a really, really good tool. Um, I love doing it. But yes, you're right. If you want to have a 112 on one amp, a 412 on another, Whatever you want to do, that's the beauty. But it does humanize it. It takes very digital sounds and gives it a speaker response. It's a very, very good tool. I've recently, like over the last year, really come to embrace impulse responses and I think that they are a massive, massive help to what we do. Have you ever tried blending real amps with amp modelers and cab sims? Absolutely. Apps are bleeding lootly. I do it all the time, and I think that is, to be honest, it goes back. When I was working with Dave Jordan, I believe it was in 98, he did Americana by Osprey, 
which those of you might remember was an absolutely massive album. The song Pretty Fly for a White Guy. It was a really, really massive, massive hit. And um, you know that dun And the guitar sounds were the amps that he was using which were a combination of all kinds of things. He had classic amps like Marshalls, he used some Voxes, he had everything. Dave had a massive collection of incredible amps. Plus, he started using Amp Farm. Remember Amp Farm? And he was blending Amp Farm guitar sounds with real guitar sounds and getting massive sounds. So we're going back to 98, we're going back to 20 years ago that was already happening. Those blends of artificial emulations with the real thing. And it created an absolutely massive, amazing guitar sound. So it's been going on for absolutely ages. And I highly, highly recommend you try it yourself. I've done things, and you may have seen in other videos, where I've taken a real sound and then the DI and treated the DI differently. One thing that's nice about taking a super clean DI is you can smother it with verb or a delay and create something around an amp sound, which is so unique because the reverb has a different kind of presence than the fuzzy, distorted guitar sound. Try that. Try taking your DI, putting a reverb on it, and then your amp tone and putting that in the center and let it grow around it. And you can put an amp emulation on the DI, you can do all kinds of stuff and treat them in different ways. This is a wonderful time we live in that we can do all of these kind of fun things where we're mixing in, you know, Impulse responses from cabs with emulations of different amplifiers with real tones as well. And just get, just have some fun. And, if, and remember, try messing around a little bit. If you're gonna use two or three different sources, run delays on them, you know, so that they create a different kind of width. But also, frankly, if they're delayed slightly, they're gonna get out of the way of each other and there's less likelihood for there to be phase cancellation. If I'm gonna take two or three sources and create this massive guitar sound, I might really enjoy just putting a delay or reverb on one or two of the sources, different delays and reverbs on one or two of the sources, so that there gets to be some space around it, you know, and as to reiterate, less likelihood of phase cancellation, polarity issues. So mess around with it, try all kinds of things. I highly recommend it. If you're an Academy member, a lot of the time, the multi-tracks I give you in the Academy have DIs printed. You'll also note that the song Stay that we gave you last week, here on YouTube, again, link flying around somewhere around here, of the Workday Release song, has DIs in it as well. So you can put, you can put amp emulations and simulations on that as well, and play with impulse responses. How do you prefer dealing with a drum kit with two kick drums? Do you prefer just using one mic on a double pedal or using both kicks? A lot of guys do use um, double pedals on a single kick. And I do like that. I really do like that. I think that um, makes a lot more sense. When you've got double kick drums that are sort of panned out a little bit from each other, you can individually mic them but it is going to mess up your overheads and your room mics, because it's gonna be projecting like this. So I personally do like the sound of a single kick drum with double pedals. But as a rock guy, there's nothing better than seeing a drum kit with double kick drums, and two floor toms, and a bunch of rack toms and some cymbals, and a drummer that knows how to play it. I mean, you know, that's part of the fun, isn't it? You wanna go and see like Simon Phillips play when Simon Phillips is playing drums, you don't really want to see like a kick snare and a hi-hat. It's Simon Phillips, you want to see him explore all of the toms. You want to hear him play all of those cymbals and everything he's got. I mean, a great drummer is going to utilize a small kit, but they're also going to utilize an even bigger way, a massive kit. I mean, obviously it's all song related, a great song can just be kick, snare, kick, 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 snare with a hat groove, and there it is. You know, look at uh, Walk This Way, a simple groove, super hooky, and that groove has been stolen hundreds of times. I rest my case with, of course, Led Zeppelin, When the Levee Breaks. That groove really is in thousands of songs. So it's not about having necessarily something that's overly complicated, but two answers are, Yes, I prefer the single kick for recording with double pedals. 
It's easier, it pans down the center, the overheads and the room mics see it better. However, live, it's pretty fun to see a pair of double kicks. And I have recorded those, but it sort of messes with your stereo imagery a bit. And I don't really want to pan them out. I don't want to hear kicks like this. I do want to hear them down the middle. So it gets a little annoying when your overheads don't hear them in the middle and nor do your room mics. So, but you know, that's why we mix and we figure out how to do the best possible job we can. All right, thank you ever so much for so many incredible questions. As ever, please subscribe, hit the notification bell, go to producelikeapro.com, sign up for the email list, and have a marvelous time recording and mixing, and I'll see you all again very soon.